Prince Valiant, the storytelling game by Greg Stafford. So, what is Prince Valiant? Prince Valiant is an American comic strip created by Hal Foster back in 1937. And basically, it's an epic adventure that has sold a continuous story during its entire history. And the full stretch of that story now totals more than 4,000 Sunday strips. And it currently appears in more than 300 American newspapers. The setting is Arthurian, and Valiant is a Nordic prince from Thule. When the strip started in 1937, Prince Valiant was five years old, and the first episodes followed the youth through the wild districts of Britain with his father, the deposed King Agior of Thule. Now, I'm not familiar with Prince Valiant. I believe it was also a cartoon series back in the late 80s, early 90s. The game was written by Greg Strafford, who also wrote the Pendragon RPG in 1985. And Prince Valiant, first edition, was released in 1989. Uh, Many people think that storytelling games are a relative new thing, but as you can see from this, Prince Valiant was released in the 1980s. The edition I have is the new 2017 print edition, which was funded by a Kickstarter. Mechanics. So everything in this game is done by contests and challenges by flipping a number of coins. And I'm going to come to this in a minute. So basically, you take a number of coins equal to the skill and its linked attribute if it has one. You throw the coins and each head is a success. Many actions only require you to get a single success, but more difficult or opposed actions require several successes, usually in the region of one to five heads where three is the average. Simple actions, you have a target number, so the GM will tell you that you need three successes to succeed. You throw your number of coins, and if you get the number of successes, you succeed. Opposed roles happens with NPCs or between player characters, and each opponent throws a number of coins and the one who gets the most successes wins. The winner then takes the difference between his and the loser's coins heads thrown and the loser subtracts that number of successes from their dice pool. So it's a diminishing dice pool. There is quite a substantial uh, modifier list. So if you're an advantage, if you're wearing armour, if you've got a weapon, then that will add or subtract coins from your dice pool. If every single one of your coins is a success, then you get a plus one success added to it. There are no hit points in Prince Valiant. In fact, there is no death as written. Basically, when your pool gets down to zero coins, you're out of the action. However, players can agree if it's dramatically appropriate to take an injury or you could kill a character. There is also a nice mass combat system for doing large medieval battles, which is nice and simple, but it gives a big flavour for the period. Now, if you go back into my back catalogue, back in episode 30, I covered the ubiquity system as used in Hollow Earth Expedition, Space 1889, and All for One. And I'm a big fan of the ubiquity system, which is a binary dice system. And it is very easy to convert Prince Valiant to a binary dice system. Instead of using coins, you can use the binary dice that you can obtain from places like Amazon and eBay. And basically they are six-sided dice with three zeros and three ones on them. Alternatively, if you don't want to use the coins and you don't want to invest in some binary dice, but why wouldn't you, because they're nice, you can use conventional six-sided dice and count four to sixes as successes. So it's very simple to convert and I am unlikely to throw a handful of coins, so I'm more likely to use a dice system. Character creation. In the basic game, you play a knight of the realm. You have two attributes, brawn and presence, and you allocate seven points between those two attributes. You then have six skills, and as a knight, you must take the arms and riding skills, because those are basic skills for any knight, and pick four other skills. There are 14 skills in the basic game. Then you divide nine points between the six skills, and any skill's maximum is six. You get some possessions and 800 fame. 
Fame is the currency of XP in this game. Every thousand points you get in fame, you can increase one of your skills. But fame is also used in other circumstances when you compare to other characters. And it is your renown or your social standing. And the higher fame that you have, the higher precedence you have, and you're more likely to get some sort of advantage against an opponent. So that is the character creation. There is also an advanced game. Now, as you can see, the basic game is pretty simple. So the advanced game adds to this, but there's not a lot more to, to make it too much more complicated. So the first thing it does, it adds other character options or occupations. So besides playing a knight, you could play a monk, a merchant, a viking, a hunter, a peasant, and with the GM's approval, a thief. Those character occupations, instead of starting with 800 fame, start with 500. The advanced game also adds another 15 skills to the pot, and these range from alchemy to stealth. So you've got your pick there. Another subsystem it adds is traits. And the character can have three traits. Traits can either be positive or negative, And they remain hidden for other players until they come into play. But you are awarded fame for playing them. And it also gives the GM something to hook onto and maybe bring out one of your traits. The next thing the advanced game adds is gold stars. And gold stars are like those you got in primary school. They're earned for excellent role playing, and when you are awarded a gold star by the GM, you put it onto your character sheet. And each gold star allows you one extra coin to be added to a dice throw once per session. The next thing it adds is storytelling certificates, and players earn these by taking part in the storytelling. So the GM or the chief storyteller, as it is known in Prince Valiant, remains, but somebody else can add to the storytelling. So this might be a cool scene I thought of that might be appropriate for the setting. It might be a flashback where we reveal something important. And when one of these are added by one of the players, they earn a storyteller certificate. And these can be surrendered at any time to gain a one-time narrative effect. So, storytelling is really baked into the system. Magic. Magic in this setting is very rare, and as such, there is no magic system at all in Prince Valiant for player characters. It explains to the GM that they can use magic, but magic should be rare, and it's up for them to decide how magic is used. And this is used for, like, if you're Merlins of the world. There is no separate bestiary, but at the back of the book, there are a number of scenarios or episodes. And these include NPC stats and a smattering of monsters. And there's 20 episodes at the rear of the book, and they're really well thought out. Uh, it's, for example, you, have, you can rescue a damsel in distress, you can fight some invaders, or you can go into mortal combat with an enemy. And the episodes are really what makes the system good. Also available is an episode book which contains another 34 episodes, which is well worth getting, especially if you can get it in the sales as I did. And there's a nice variety of episodes in that book. So what are my thoughts on Prince Valiant? Well, I managed to get Prince Valiant in the New Year sales, so I got the book and the episode book for the same price as just buying the hardback core book. Both books have excellent production values and they really do use the theme of the comic strip. And if you do an internet search, you can view some of the comic strips to get an idea of the art in them. And it liberally uses Hal Foster's art throughout. It is a simple dice pool system and I'm a big, big fan of dice pool systems. And this system could easily be hacked for other genres. So for me... Prince Valiant, the role-playing game, or the storytelling game, as I should say, gets a big thumbs up from me. And now for some call-ins. Hey, Pete, it's Edwin here. Um, I've just finished lis listening to your review, um, end of year review. Congratulations on finishing um, your first 
part yeah of, of the podcasting um i for one enjoy the, the your cast very much um i i like the um practical approach you, you take to questions and um solutions you come up with um i agree entirely about online gaming um i i was very apprehensive um about starting um i'm going to have to break here i was apprehensive about taking the, the plunge into online gaming um but through the audio um dungeon dis discord um i've i found as you um i i found games to play and um, you and the other guys have been very welcoming um I'm obsessed with me. I haven't yet heard your episode about War of the Worlds. Um, that's partly because I like to listen to people's backlogs in order. Um, I should listen to it because it's something that I hear a lot. The call, the call sounded interesting. The question of the crossover um, with other worlds and Vern's works. Um, and I'm going again. The idea of a crossover put me in mind of a book I'd read where um, Arthur Conan Doyle's characters get involved. Um, there's um, Sherlock Holmes, of course, but um, more to my mind um, was Professor Challenger, because um, I'm, I'm a fan of Professor Challenger. Um, either Wells or Conan Doyle, and I think it might be Conan Doyle, had written a story where there was a mysterious, large mysterious crystal, which turned out to be a communication device with Mars. Um, and that's the kind of tech that could, could come in useful in such a crossover game. Uh, the people uh, Mithras have put together a setting uh, called Worlds United, which assumes that the events Yes, Mithras have put a setting together called Worlds United, in which they assume that the, the Martian invasion happened as Wells um, uh, depicted them, and that there was a second invasion um, in the 1930s, which ties in with the awesome Wells invasion story. Um, they've pushed it on a few decades, so it's the 1950s, 60s, and Earth has gone out to Mars and Venus and met their natives and colonising them. Um, I don't know if that sounds like your cup of tea. Um, I have the book, but I've um, not done anything with it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for the podcast. Bye now. Thanks for that series of callings, Edwin. I'm glad I'm not the only one that's found the Audio Dungeon Discord so welcoming and useful. As you say, it's a great way to get into some games, and I have got in a couple of online games with Edwin, so that's great to see that he's embraced the online gaming as well. Some really good ideas there you've got about bringing stuff into War of the Worlds and cross-pollination. Yeah, it uh, is ripe for it, isn't it? The book that Edwin is talking about is from the, the design mechanism. It's called Worlds United. And the blurb says, what if the Martians really did invade Earth in 1897 and again in 1938? Venus really is a lush jungle planet where dinosaurs still roam. Psionics are a reality. Crystal technology, an everyday fact of life. Rockets ply the space lanes between Mars, Earth, Venus and the asteroids. The year is 1959. That's what I've just read off Drive Through RPG. I've not got that one, but it sounds right up my street. So thanks for that one, Edwin. I'm going to check that one out. Hi, Pete. It's Edwin here. I'm just listening to episode 37, where you and Jason talk about the Sean Connery film Outland. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, there's a module... Um, written by an associate of mine called the titan incident uh his name is william adcock and it's published by chaosium 
for their Call of Cthulhu setting. Um, it's set in the 22nd, 23rd century on the moon Titan, which was a, planet, uh, was a penal colony, is now a mining colony, and weird shit is happening. Uh, it may appeal. And of course, I should have said that Bill's module is available on Drive Through RPG. But um, it's been um, very well reviewed and has since been received received well. Um, yeah, it just might all tie in with with the alien and the the cops in space kind of thing. Yeah. Thanks for that recommendation, Edwin. I'm not aware of that product. So thanks for bringing it to my attention. The Titan incident is only £4.60 on a drive through RPG. So I will certainly let Jason know about that one as well. I think that might be right up his street. So thanks for the tip on that one. So that's it for this episode. I've got some more episodes planned, including another review upcoming. And that's going to be, if it all goes to plan, a shared one with John from the Red Dice Diaries. So listen out for that one upcoming. And hopefully we're going to have some more actual plays with the my fellow Purple Worms. The first episode is now up as a podcast and as a actual play on YouTube. So you can actually see us in all our glory. And when you see the four of us, you realise why we've got a face for podcasters. So... Thanks all for listening and I'll catch you again soon so and I'll see you all on the flip side. You have been listening to the Dragons Are Real podcast. My name is Pete Jones. You can find more information at my website at petejones.neocities.org or at my blog at dragonsarealpodcast.tumblr.com The opening music was Fireflies and Stardust by Kevin MacLeod. The closing music, also by Kevin MacLeod, was Fretless.